So um, if you were able to install Phi and able to download uh, the mini data set that we sent you, then um, when you load it up, it'll come up um, pretty much like this. Um, so let me just tell you that the, the data set that we sent, um, this thing called mini data set, it's not a ground truth data set from, from, uh, from the Marcus Smith paper, um, like Matteo suggested it might be yesterday. Uh, we had done that in years past, but um, it would have been many gigabytes to send uh, that file. Uh, you can download it from the Camp Lab website. We'll, we'll kind of make sure you have a link for that if you want to try to do some spike sorting on the ground truth data sets. Um, but instead, what we sent you um, to make the download times reasonable was um, uh, this thing called mini data set, which is just a clip of NeuroPixel's uh, 1.0 recording. And so in this mini data set, um, the, the total duration of the data is not very long. I think it's maybe a minute or something like that. Um, and uh, it's not even all of the channels on the probe either. So it's really just clipping out a small section of a recording um, that we can send with a reasonable um, file size and play with in, in Phi. Um, to be clear, actually, in reference to the previous question, um, the sorting was done on the much larger full data set. Um, and, this, and then we clipped out the results. Um, and so I don't think the sorting results would have worked as well um, if we had just done it on this small segment to begin with. Okay, so um, basically what I'm going to do is sort of walk through these different views and show you what you're seeing here. And then um, we'll just talk about a few different cases of what kind of um, things that you might see and deal with. Um, so feel free to interrupt at any point if um, things aren't clear. Okay, so um, when you load, um, you get this cluster view. It has the ID of all the clusters, which is just a reference number. Um, it has the channel that they're on, um, and that refers to the channel on the channel map, um, which you can see those labeled um, numerically in the um, in the waveform view. Um, so for instance, this cluster number 176 that we have selected, it says it's on channel 24, and that's because its peak channel is right here on channel 24. Um, shank, shank is zero. Uh, uh, obviously, NeuroPixels 1.0 probes um, that you'll use have one shank, so, so that's um, always going to be the case. Um, depth refers to the, um, the position of this channel along the um, y-axis of the channel coordinates, um, and so it's 3260. Um, and if we go all the way over here, move this other way. Um, so I've put, um, and by the way, I guess here, here I'll point out that you can, um, when you're using this, um, GUI, you can sort of move these uh, windows around just to wherever you want them and resize them and rescale them, et cetera. Um, so I, I stuck this uh, cluster scatter view and probe view right next to each other over here on the right. Um, and doing so, it's, it's sort of easy to tell um, what the, the depth of, uh, of different channels are uh, on the probe in, in units of microns, uh, which are these, these numbers here. Um, Okay, so that's depth. So FR is firing rate, this particular neuron of uh, about six spikes per second. Amplitude is um, an amplitude in units of the file, so, so it's kind of arbitrary units again. Um, to get to uh, real units, you, what you will want to do is to um, extract the um, waveforms and then multiply it by the gain scaling factor. Um, and so that's just not the units that you see here. Um, You'd want to do that post hoc if you want to get it in microvolts. Um, and n spikes, the number of spikes in this unit, 356. Okay. So um, this is just a list of all your clusters. You can click them to flip through them, um, and it'll update the views and show you the updated one. Okay. Um, next view uh, I'll talk about is this waveform view. So what we're seeing here is um, for the given cluster. So a cluster is defined by um, a set of spike times. That's really all it is. Um, and what we're doing here is clipping out a little segment of the raw data at each of those spike times and overlaying them according to which channel the raw data came from. So um, a given sample trace here came from a certain spike time that was apparently the spike time of uh, unit number 117. Um, and then the same spike time is shown in one of the example traces in each of these. Um, and so you can see that every time um, unit 117 spiked, um, we got a deflection here and a little bit of a deflection on a few of these other channels as well. And uh, we can see the mean by pressing M. Um, how did I know to press M? 
Well, in every single one of these views, there's a little drop down here and it gives you all of the um, options that are available to you. And you can see one of them is toggle mean waveforms. Um, so I could click it and get the mean waveform, um, or I could learn that the shortcut key is M, um, and then I can just press M. And, and that this applies, you can just go through view after view and like learn all the different um, options that are available in this way. Uh, Nick? Yep. Someone is asking to repeat what is the multiplication factor that will give you the extra microvolts for the spike amplitude. So that depends on the gain setting that you used, and it's given by the table that I showed in the very first slide this morning. Um, so that, that table is on the wiki, um, and you can also um, uh, refer back to this, this, uh, um, the slides here when, when we post them online. Um, so if you use the default of 250, uh, sorry, of 500, gain 500, then it's 2.34 microvolts per bit. So when you read out the, the values of the waveforms from the raw data file, you will multiply them by 2.34 um, to get microvolts. Okay. All right, um, and so you can also do things like scaling. Hopefully I can do this uh, scaling in different ways uh, like this. Okay, so you can scale in different ways. Um, okay, um, what are we looking for in the waveform view? So we're looking for the, we're looking for it to be the case that every waveform looks the same. Um, it's obviously not the case that every waveform is exactly the same, right? In fact, you know, you can see uh, there's uh, different kinds of variation. Um, for instance, there's a lot of variation out here. Is that a problem? Not really. Uh, what about this variation here? Is that a problem? Not really, uh, because basically that reflects the fact that at the same time this neuron spiked, there were other neurons spiking around it in time um, at slightly different times, slightly different spatial positions. Um, and that's okay. Um, that's just the reality of the recording, and it's um, not a problem that those things look noisy. But what you want to be as little noisy as possible is um, the individual sort of like the part of the spike that seems to correspond to this neuron, the central part of the spike, um, and you want that to be as as little noise as possible. And this one is this one is okay. Um, it's a little bit uh, variable. Um, which might, might, might just reflect instability in the recording. It might be the case that this neuron is not a well-isolated single neuron. Um, uh, let's see, let's just try a different one and see if we can sort of compare some different uh, options. So this one, I would say, looks a little bit more reliable than the last one, right? These are a little bit more consistent. And so this one has a little bit of a nicer look than the last one. Um, so there's no, there's nothing quanti- well, some papers have proposed a way to quantify that, but basically uh, we don't, we don't rely on anything quantify, quantifiable there. Um, it's just something to look at. Um, and I think, yeah, well, I'll, sh I'll show you like a, what a really bad one looks like later. Um, okay, so in general though, you want every waveform to be consistent within the slide. Okay, next view, um, amplitude view down here. So amplitude view, is um, showing as a function of time during the recording, x axis is time. Yeah, we have one minute of recording, 60 seconds. Um, what were the amplitudes of the spikes? Now, what is amplitude? It's not amplitude in microvolts, again. Um, it is instead amplitude in um, units of that scaling factor. So Marius, when he described the algorithm earlier, he mentioned this parameter A, which is the amplitude scaling factor for every single spike. And that is what is plotted here. So it's relative to the shape of the waveform. Um, and so, uh, yeah, again, the units here then are not microvolts. Um, but uh, what we can look for on this plot is whether the amplitude um, has a Gaussian distribution like this neuron does, which is a good sign because we would expect um, background biological variation and noise variation among spikes to, to result in a Gaussian distribution of amplitudes versus um, a non-Gaussian distribution of amplitudes. And I can pick one that does not, let me, so what I'm gonna do is find a low amplitude one like this guy. Oh, that one actually doesn't look so bad. It's small amplitude, but it's on a not so noisy channel. Let's try a different one. Okay, so this one um, is very low amplitude. You can see it's like, barely above the noise. It's got a little deflection. You know, there's something there, but it's not It's not very high amplitude relative to the noise level. Um, and we switch to the mean, we just have this little tiny little bump. Um, and the result of it having a really low amplitude is that 
um, it's amplitude histo histogram here. Um, so this blue is the marginal distribution of all the blue spikes um, here. Um, is not Gaussian. You can see it's very non-Gaussian, right? It's like cut off at the at the bottom. And what that means is that um, you know even if all of these spikes really do correspond to spikes from one particular neuron, it's very likely that we've lost a lot of the spikes of that neuron below uh, the noise floor. So um, we would have expected the true spikes to have a Gaussian distribution. This is cut off, meaning that there were some spikes here that we must have missed. Um, and or it's just noise entirely is, is another option. Okay, so that's a particular kind of error in your data then. Um, you could, you know, you can have different kinds of errors and you need to think about at all times um, what kinds of scientific uh, questions you have and what kinds of errors would create problems for those scientific questions. Um, so specifically in this case, um, if we wanted to include this neuron in our analyses, um, we want to be aware that at least one kind of error that we're going to have is false negatives. That is, we're missing spikes from this neuron. These spikes um, do not count for all of the spikes that this neuron fired. Um, and if we have a particular kind of analysis that um, that is is going to uh, give us a biased or incorrect result by having missed some of the spikes, then this is the neuron we want to exclude for that analysis. Okay. One new question. Yep. Um, when you see a spike recorded across multiple electrodes, are they usually directly adjacent? Do, do more distant electrodes appear to record the same spike? Um, yeah, you usually will see, I mean, like, so even for this guy, right, you can see that the amplitude is biggest um, here and then gets smaller, so I just zoomed in, um, and then gets smaller and smaller as you go away, and it's basically flat for all these distant channels. Um, and that is what you will usually see. I mean, very occasionally you could see, like, sort of, yeah, basically, basically, if you see if you see some big amplitude over here and some big amplitude over here, it's probably um, that that something went wrong. Uh, you, you should see it spatially clustered. I mean, in principle, you could have like some process of the like some cell body over here and then an axon that like goes away from the probe and then comes back to the probe. Um, in practice, I don't think we really see that kind of thing. Okay, so the amplitude view is this one, um, and uh, th that, that's one kind of error that you can observe in your, um, in your data. All right, feature view is um, plotting uh, principal component features of the spikes. Let me, oops, let me try to there we go. zoom in here a bit. Um, so it's plotting, uh, sorry, it's getting dim. Let me see if I can increase the marker size. I think this is working, but there's no hotkey for it, so it's going to take a second. <laughs> um, is it? Let me see if I, this is it. OK, well, OK. Um, all right, so basically, um, what's plotted here, then, is uh, on the x and y axes are principal component projections of these spikes. Um, and this is a, if, if you. If you um, have done any classic spike sorting algorithms or uh, classic spike sorting, you know, uh, manual methods, you will have looked at principal component projections of this spike and other spikes, um, and sort of tried to discriminate whether they're in multiple clusters or not. And so this is sort of giving us a view in this kind of classic way of looking at the spikes um, to help us assess whether, um, in a sort of algorithm independent way, in a way that's different from what Killisor was using to make the decision. Um, whether they, there are multiple clusters within this neuron, whether we need to make a split or something like that. Um, and I guess actually we can we can go ahead. Let me um, let me just try to. Uh, that's a bad choice. Let me just try to pick a couple neurons that we can try to sort of illustrate this with. Uh, so I'm going to pick. If I select two neurons at a time, I made a bad choice. One sec. So I'm going to Maybe you can also my... quickly say what the gray sure. dots are. The gray dots are just um, principal components from other other spikes that were on these channels, not from the unit that's selected. Um, so the color code shows the unit that's selected. Um, so let me, I'm just, so I sorted by channel so I can find um, some channels that have more spikes. And now I'm just going to pick uh, two units that are kind of on the same channels. Um, how come I got one?
Okay. Um, yeah, good. So these two units are on the same channel. You can see on channel 39 here. And in fact, they're not too much different in, in uh, waveform shape. They're a little bit different. Um, we can show the mean waveform. Um, we can do O for overlay um, to overlay the mean waveform and see that indeed they are a bit different. Um, and in the principal components view, you can see a few different views um, where in some of these views, um, like on some channels or some principal component features, they look like they're overlaid. Um, but on other views, we can see that they're clearly um, uh, composed of two, two distinctive clusters. And therefore, we feel pretty good about these being two different uh, units on the basis of this view. Um, so that's what you're seeing there. Um, uh, template feature view is um, the one that Marius mentioned where you're looking for bimodalities or looking for um, uh, combined clusters. Um, in this data set that I sent you, unfortunately, the template features um, are, are not included. Um, so you'll just see zeros there, and I apologize for that. Um, but if you run kill sort on one of your real data sets, they, they really ought to show up here. Um, okay, next view. Let, let me now let me sort again by um, spike rate and pick one that's up here. Okay, so next view is the Corellogram view. So the Corellogram view is um, showing the autocorellogram. It's the probability that the neuron has a spike at a given time point relative to another spike of that neuron. And the fact that it's zero um, and low values right around the middle of the plot means that the neuron has a low probability of, to spike around the same time it already spiked. And that is the definition of a refractory period. Um, as you all probably know, that's a, that's a classic property of, of neurons uh, and allows us to sort of like verify that this is one neuron and not multiple neurons. Um, if we, for instance, um, select this neuron along with another neuron that's somewhere else on the probe, Whoops, I didn't mean to pick all of them, though that's cool. Um, so I'll pick two neurons. Um, now you can see that each of them has a decent um, autocorellogram. Uh, this one better than that one. This one has a little bit of contamination, but the cross correlogram is flat. Um, and I think Mari has mentioned this before too, that uh, the cross correlogram being flat while the autocorellograms have dips is a great sign that these are not the same neuron. Of course, in this case, we can see that clearly from the waveforms. They're in completely different sets of channels. Um, but but uh, in addition, the, the cross correlogram uh, shows us that these really can't be the same neurons. Um, because if we merge them, which I'll go ahead and do, um, hopefully, error when executing action merge. <laughs> Yeah, it's given me an error. I'm not sure why I got an error. Maybe me start. In the meantime, there are a couple of questions. Yep. Um, are principal components calculated across the whole data set or across subsections? And related to this, they're very hard to interpret. Do you ever use classic measures like energy? Um, uh, so the first one was about are they calculated for the whole time or in subsections? Uh, so the principal components are calculated for the whole time. Um, that that was the question. Sorry, sorry that I was trying to restart this and got distracted. No problem. Yes, this was the question, the first one, and because they are hard to interpret. Did you try using different um, measures like energy? Well, so to be clear, the um, the principal components are um, not used by kill sort in the spike sorting algorithm. They are just used here for us to um, be able to have a different view of the output. Um, you can so maybe now is the time that I can go back to um, what those output files are. So there's an output file from Killosaur, which is called pc underscore features that MPY, and it just has the, these principal component features that Killosaur has computed for convenience. If you want to replace it with different features, then you'll see different features when you bring up the GUI. Um, so you can like, overwrite that file with different values and, and like motion energy or whatever energy that you want to compute, um, and it will show up in, in five. So that's no problem. Yeah. And. Uh Relating to cross correlograms, what about neurons that are in synchrony? Shouldn't they have a dip at t equals zero? Uh, no. 
Um, the reason is that uh, there are no neurons that I'm aware of that fire in such close synchrony that they would actually have a dip on this millisecond time scale. So, right, so the vertical lines here are minus two milliseconds plus two milliseconds. Um, I really don't think, I mean, I'm not aware of any brain region, not even, you know, in sharp wave ripples in the hippocampus that you have that kind of timing precision um, where you would get no instances of overlaps and uh, of two, two separate neurons. Um, of course, I, I mean, I agree with the question in the sense that it's, it's definitely possible in principle, right? You can imagine a neural system somehow that, that had that property, um, but I'm just not aware of any system that has it. You should basically consult the literature about the um, brain regions that you're recording from if you think that that might be happening. Okay, I'm gonna try to merge again um, and we'll see if I get the same error. Okay, that time it worked, great. So, okay, so you can see I merged um, and um, what happened was now my waveforms look like crap because some of these waveforms like these came from the first cluster that I had before I merged and some of them like these came from the second cluster that I had um, before I merged. And up here I have the second cluster in the actual waveforms and the first cluster in the flat ones. Um, so now I've got all of these waveforms from two different units all mixed up together into one. And now you can see that I do not have um, a, a, uh, a clean refractory period. And that's because indeed I have spikes from two neurons uh, grouped into one here rather than uh, just one neuron. Okay, so I can actually do control Z uh, or command Z on Mac uh, to, to undo that merge and go back to our original state where they're separate. Okay. ISI, very similar to Corellogram, um, but has the inner spike interval, uh, uh, which shows a similar thing. Uh, firing rate over time of this neuron, so you can tell whether it maybe disappears during part of the recording. Okay, um, just a couple more views, and then we'll talk about actually doing the sorting. Oops, still trying to grab these, grab these little edges. All right. So this one is the raw data view. Wow, it's somehow very difficult for me. Okay. Um, so this one is the raw data view. So you can basically um, zoom in. I'm doing like a right click and drag to sort of pan or zoom around and um, click and drag to pan, uh, scroll wheel to zoom in and out, et cetera. And it'll highlight the places you can find different spikes. And you can actually, really cool feature, um, if you want to find um, a unit that corresponds to a particular spike, like this guy, for instance, I can control click and it'll select um, that unit for me. Um, so I can select that guy instead, for instance. Uh, and uh, that's a really nice way to sort of just look at the raw data and to um, zoom around and see different neurons that are there. Okay, um, good, good. Okay, so this view is cluster scatter view. Y axis is depth. Um, each uh, dot corresponds to a different cluster. You can click on it and the X axis is the amplitude. Um, so you can click on it and find that cluster. Here was a relatively small amplitude one um, at this certain depth. Um, if I click out here, I'll get a bigger amplitude one um, at the same depth. Um, so this is just another way to visualize all of your spikes and sort of navigate around a little bit. Um, and finally, this probe view over here, um, each dot here is one of the recording sites in the probe. You can see this is a Neurocosis 1.0. It has this staggered geometry um, that you've seen uh, before. And um, the blue ones are the ones that are shown in the waveform view over here. So you can tell which part of the probe you're looking at. Um, so if I pick, for instance, this neuron up here, um, yeah, then now I'm seeing that neuron here and uh, seeing the top channels. And I pick one down here and I see that neuron. I'm on the bottom channels now, and those are these channels over here. Um, any questions about what we're seeing in all of these views? And then we'll talk about um, the process of actually doing the spike sorting. Yes, there is a, a question about template feature view. What kind of analysis do you perform there, I guess, or what performs this view? This view? Um, so when you run Killisort, you should get, um, when you run Killisort and then you uh, select two different units, you should get something in template feature view. Um, it's just broken for this one particular data set that I sent you. That's my fault. Uh, but if you run it on your own data set, you should see a scatter plot there when you select two units. Um, right now it's just showing zeros. So, um, yeah. Maybe you get there, but there's a question. Um, once there is a cluster identified as MUA by KiloSword, could you please show us how to split the cluster into two? Yeah, so 
yeah, good. So let's start. Uh, uh, let's just yeah start talking about the spike sorting. Um, so um, exactly. So so what I'm going to do. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll just take um, these two clusters sort of at random, um, and we'll we'll start with the splitting. So I'm I'm going to merge these so that we get something that needs to be split. Um, and you can kind of see on the waveforms that there's now like sort of two different groups of waveforms in here. This, these were pretty noisy actually. Uh, maybe I should have picked a better one. Let's pick a better one. Uh, let me pick, let me sort by amplitude um, and I'll pick this guy and this guy. Ah, those are different. Let's not pick that guy. Okay. How about this guy? Okay. Um, so if I um, merge two units together um, and I result in a case where um, I get something that needs to be split, which could happen from the kill sort algorithm itself, and maybe it returns you a guy that looks like this, and you think, wow, look, there's two different types of waveforms in this one unit. This really needs to be split. How do we split it? Um, what you do is you go to um, either, uh, you go to a feature view and you find a view where you can see that there's two clusters. Um, so here's one. Uh, you know, you want to pick the one where they're best separated. Uh, any anything where they're well separated will work. Uh, maybe I pick this one. Okay, so I can see the two clusters, and then what you do is you um, control click. Uh, let's try command click on Mac. Okay, so you command click. I'm holding down command the whole time I'm doing this, and I'm doing a left normal mouse click, and I can draw out a polygon. Now I'm going to release command um, once the polygon is finished drawing and um, do the split option, which is here, split. And so it's the K hotkey, so I can press K. And now I've split out those two groups of spikes. And you can see I was pretty successful here. Um, all of the one spike are in this unit um, and all of the other spike are in the other unit. Okay. Um, and I guess we can, if I undo and undo again. Oh, no. Okay, I think it did undo again. Uh, it just didn't show me it. Um, so these were the two that I had. Um, so this was the original um, undo, original splitting. Um, and actually, yeah, I think uh, the original was even better than what I did, but, um, but uh, we were basically successful there. So in general, you don't wanna be doing splitting. Um, the reasons for that are twofold. Um, one is that you can't see in as many dimensions as Killisort can see, so it will have been able to find a better split than you. And the second reason is that it's very time consuming to do. Um, you can tell it's like drawing out this little, first of all, you, you're sort of like trying to identify that there's a split. Secondly, you're trying to like go around and like find a view that you can see it. And then you're drawing out this little polygon, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, it really just takes a lot of time. And you, you know, with a, with a Neuropix data set with hundreds of units, um, you just probably don't have time to be doing splits. So if you see something that needs to be split, I would say, if you see many things that need to be split, you ought to try um, adjusting the algorithm parameters so that that doesn't happen. If you see one or two things that need to be split, I would probably just call them multi-unit activity, um, which is the correct description of what they are, and not worry about trying to rescue them um, because you're just going to spend too much of your time doing that. But that would be my recommendation. Um, let me just check what kind of time we have. So we're going until, OK, so we have about 40 minutes. Great. OK, so that's splitting. Um, so let's talk about merging. So I, I found an example um, before time, beforehand. That's one that we should need to merge. Um, so what's so what's the normal process of spike sorting? So um, you pull up a unit. Um, you can check briefly um, the uh, the waveforms and the feature component, uh, the feature views, to check um, whether it looks like there are multiple units in here. Like if there's two clusters um, visible, or if there's two types of waveforms visible. I don't see anything here that really strikes me that way. So um, I. I'm going to satisfy myself that this is not obviously a multi-unit um, activity. Um, I can check briefly the Corellogram view. It looks clean, although I don't have many spikes here, and that's because I clipped out this small data set. Um, but I don't have many spikes here, so I don't have great confidence in the Corellogram view. In any case, it looks clean. Um, and I can check the amplitude and make sure it's not cut off. It looks Gaussian. So all of that's good. So all of that is good news about this neuron. But I'm not done yet, because I need to check whether there might be another um, cluster that has some of the same spikes from this neuron, um, in which case we'll need to merge them together. Okay, um, And uh, the basic process is to look through every combination 
of this cluster with every other cluster. Um, obviously, that would be insane because there are many other clusters. And so um, Phi is set up to have what it calls the wizard, which sort of um, steps you through the most similar um, other clusters. And so you can see this similarity view here. It's a list of clusters, um, but each one has a similarity um, value in the column, uh, which, it, which you didn't have up here. So this is sort of your master list. And this one has a similarity value with the one that's selected up here. So I selected cluster 11 up here. Um, 0.937 is the similarity between cluster 11 and 180. Uh, and uh, similarity score goes up to one, and this is the highest one in the data set. Um, and it's, it's um, by the way, the similarity score is measuring the similarity of the waveform shape. Um, and you can see, if, especially if I put uh, mean waveforms and then overlay them, wow, indeed, these are really similar waveforms, right? And so it's no wonder that they got a really high similarity score, these two units. Um, and I, I, by the way, I activated, um, so you could either, so for instance, if I um, select cluster 11, um, I could either just click down here and then there, I got to where I was. The other thing you can do, um, and you'll wanna learn these hotkeys to get fast at it, is um, to uh, press spacebar, uh, which is um, next, basically on the wizard. So this is the, the wizard um, uh, hotkeys. And so you wanna do next and previous, which is space and shift space. Uh, so I just do space. And I get this one. And again, I can do space again to switch to the next one in the list or the next one in the list and shift space to go back. Um, so this allows you to flip through the units that are closest to uh, this one. OK, so what am I looking for? So first of all, it is the case that it looks like the waveforms are super similar here, right? Boom, uh, crazy. Uh, secondly, um, I'm going to look at the Corellogram view. Um, that's the next thing I'm going to look at because, again, uh, as Marius also mentioned, this is a really strong feature to help you determine, especially when you have longer recordings and higher frame rate neurons. Um, the more spikes you have, the more useful the Corellogram view becomes. But we can already see, even with just a small spike count from these neurons, that the auto Corellograms in blue and in red look very similar in shape. They have about the same uh, width of refractory period and about the same sort of like shape out here. Um, and the cross Corellograms, really tellingly, um, also have a clean refractory period and also have a very similar shape. Okay, so if the cross curlograms uh, have a clean refractory period, um, and especially if the cross curlogram also has roughly the same shape as the auto curlograms, this is your signature that these almost certainly must be the same neuron. So coupled with the fact that the waveform looked about the same, um, there's really no way these could be different neurons. Um, and so we would merge them. Um, we'd merge them, and then we'd press spacebar again to jump straight back into the process of uh, comparing with other uh, units to figure out whether there's anything else that needs to be merged uh, with, these, with these. And you can see the next one I got here is actually a sort of a curious case, right? Um, this next one, uh, it sort of does look like it's probably the same unit, except it's just kind of um, crappier. Like the waveforms look sort of noisier here, whereas this is like a relatively tight bundle of waveforms here and here. These guys are relatively sh sh sort of shaggy and, and raggly. Um, and uh, in addition, we don't have quite a clean refractory period. Um, so I would say these spikes, especially because there's only a few of them, only 38 spikes, um, correspond to some sort of uh, sort of some sort of like corrupted or noisy spikes. And um, especially because, uh, like I mentioned, there, there's only a few of them. Um, I think we're best here just um, throwing these out and labeling them as multi-unit activity um, because we're not going to feel really confident about whether these spikes indeed correspond to spikes from this neuron or not. Um, so to label them as multi-unit, what we want to do is, is make a label. Um, and that's going to be a move operation. So we're moving it from one uh, label to another. Um, and we have two op op options. We can move best or we can move similar. Um, so best is the blue one. That's the one we're sort of thinking of as um, our current uh, best guess of what a, a good single unit is, that's blue. Um, similar is the red one. That's the one we're comparing to it. Um, and so right now, what the operation I want to do is move similar to MUA, um, because I decided these are sort of um, not a clean refractory period. The waveforms don't look good. Um, and I just don't want to um, uh, merge it with my blue one. Um, and so I'll move similar to MUA. That's Command M, I could have done. Um, and so what happened now is it got a label of MUA. Um, which is indicated by this sort of gray color rather than white um, in the text. And now we won't see it again. Um, and we've moved straight on to the next 
the next one that we can consider uh, merging. Um, so this next one looks significantly more promising. Uh, it's it's now got the uh, the same uh, waveforms. They look um, uh, as clean as our original unit, um, and the refractory period and the cross correlogram both have clean uh, clean aspect. And again, these decisions are easier the more spikes you have. So if you had if we had uh, many more spikes along a recording, um, it would be more obvious how clean these were. It would be more obvious what we could get from the cross correlograms. Um, but basically, this one looks pretty good. Um, I think it's the same unit. Uh, I see them all overlapping in all of these views up here, for instance, another thing to check. Um, so again, I'll merge. And that's it. You just go straight down. Um, so now we're on uh, the next one, the next one, the next one. Um, uh, in this particular data set that I sent you, there are a lot of these kinds of merges and probably some splits that you're going to be able to find. Um, it was actually sorted with kill sort one. So this is an older uh, sorting, um, and it had more of this kind of problem that you sort of had to deal with. Um, but it's good for practice in that way. You can see what some examples of these things look like. Um, with uh, Killasort 2, you'll really have many fewer of this kind of thing uh, to, to deal with. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, um, yeah, so for, so for the homework, basically what you're going to be doing is going through, uh, going through this data set. Uh, what I recommend you do is go through this data set and just uh, try, to, try to do uh, the sorting. Um, let, let's finish out this 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 unit, and then and then I'll stop for questions, some more questions. Um, so what you would do um, is go through until you think there's no more to merge. So let me merge uh, this one and uh, spacebar, and now on the next one, um, the next one is uh, a little bit noisier, um, but it should be the same neuron. Um, and you can see we're probably just there's a couple of violations of the cross correlogram. We're probably introducing a little bit of noise here. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and merge this though, and go on. That one looks really good. Cross correlogram looks good. I'm going to merge it and go on. Um, again, same same story. Cross correlogram looks good. Uh, waveform looks good. I'm going to merge and go on. Uh, this one only has a few spikes, and they're a little a little bit funny looking. Um, I don't quite like them, so I'm going to call that. Uh, MUA, so I'll label that MUA. This one is really only a few spikes, and they really look crappy, so let's call that MUA. Um, this one has more spikes, but now they look different, right? Um, in our in our main unit, um, this guy has a larger amplitude than that one. In this one, this one has a larger amplitude than that one. So I'm thinking this is a different um, a different unit altogether. Um, so I'm going to uh, skip over it by pressing space. Uh, this one uh, has a clearly different waveform. And also now we can see this signature here where the cross correlogram is flat with no dip. Um, and so that's, again, um, an indication that this, this unit, um, which itself is probably multi-unit activity, you can see it has really low amplitudes. Um, it looks kind of noisy. Um, it has not a clean refractory period itself, so it's probably multi-unit. Um, and we can go ahead and label it that way. But it's definitely not the same unit as the blue one because it has no dip in the refractory period. Um, so we'll we'll go ahead and label it multi-unit and move on. And so now you can see this is just a few spikes and they look different. Uh, well, it's just a few spikes. They don't look that different, but it's just a few spikes. So I'm going to throw it out. Um, I'll call it multi-unit activity. Um, and this one is now a different neuron again, flat uh, cross correlogram, different waveform shape. It's not nearly as large amplitude on this channel. You can see it's on multiple clusters here. Um, so um, at this point now, our similarity score is down to 0.638. We could we could keep flipping through and um, see if we can find anything that really looks like a good match. But at this point, we're probably not going to find anything that looks like a good match because we've already started getting to similarity scores that are low enough that apparently they reflect not having a good match. Okay, so now we're done looking through the similar ones. We think we don't have any more merges to do, and it's time to make a decision about this blue one. Do we like it or not? Um, and uh, we can put a manual label on it here. Um, which is going to be uh, move best to say good if we like option G um, on Mac. And now it turns green in this list. Um, that's fine. Uh, you can, of course, also um, stop there without putting a manual label on it and instead uh, apply some quality metrics post hoc that um, give a final determination that would, for instance, calculate um, how much contamination there is here and whether that contamination um, is sufficient for you to think that there's um, a significant percentage of spikes here that come from um, that come from other other neurons. Um, yeah, um, I'll say a bit more about quality metrics uh, in a few minutes. 
Um, but that's the whole process. So then, and then literally, uh, once we've once we've finished with that one, we either labeled it good or we just decided that we're done with all the merging and splitting we want to do, and it's simply on to the next one. And spacebar just start the process again and get going again. And again here, you know, straight into it, same same waveform shape. Uh, auto chronograms look like the cross chronograms. We're merging that spacebar for the next one, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that's pretty much the process. Um, and then as you can see, it'll take a while um, if you have lots of units, uh, and there are lots of units here. Um, uh, I think kill sort two uh, improves, like I mentioned, improves this process a lot. You can have many fewer decisions to make, uh, but there's uh, really no way around when you're starting with recording in, in your recording setup with your brain region, you really need to dive in and like do some of this um, to sort of convince yourself that the algorithm is working on your data convince yourself about what your data looks like and how good the neuron, how good quality the neurons are, et cetera. Um, you really need to understand your data at that level. Um, you can't skip this step, I don't think. Okay, time for some questions. Yep, we have a few. Um, there are two about noise. So one is just, you know, can you please an example of noise? And the other one is, um, how to distinguish noise from just small spikes? Would you mainly look at the amplitude view and like look at where the unit gets cut off? I see. Do so you mean noise? I guess I guess the implication is noise like a, like an artifact or something like that, um, as opposed to just like so, so. I can pick some here that I've sorted this by amplitude, and so I can pick some here that have really low amplitude. And these you could call noise because well, there's nothing there, um, right? There's I don't see any spikes anywhere. I mean, if I look at the mean. It's some little wiggles or something like that. So kill sort was like, you know, hallucinating here. Um, there's no spikes here. And so we could call that noise um, and we can label it noise. Uh, so that would be select move best to noise, right? Option N. Um, and then it gets this darker gray color. And um, oh, let me actually, okay. So I'll, I'll finish saying something about noise, but um, let me, important, important thing I need to mention before we go on. So there's a save button here and you must save. You can do control S also. Um, so file save, uh, command S on Mac. Um, so uh, when you save, um, it will be worthwhile for me to point out here um, what, ha what happens when you save. Um, so let me um, stop share and show the file that gets produced when you save. Uh, and then I'll come back to noise, one sec. Okay. Um, um, I guess I am going to... Uh, yeah, okay, I'm going to share my screen screen. There we go. Oh, I lost Zoom. Can you still hear me? Yes, we can hear you, yeah. Okay, I'm not sure where Zoom went. Sorry, one sec. Um, I guess I have to quit and rejoin. I can't find I can't find the Zoom window. Um, I'll be back in a sec, I guess. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> See you. In the meantime, I can remind people you can really raise your hand so you can ask your uh, question directly to Nick if you want to. Okay. Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, good. I can I have the window now. <laughs> I'm not sure what happened. <laughs> um, 
Okay, so I'm gonna share now. Okay, so now hopefully you're seeing my desktop here. Is that right? You can see this uh, browser. Yeah. Okay, great. So um, this is this um, folder of uh, files that that uh, Killasort produced and that it's using as output. Um, but now we have a new file. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure how to zoom. Uh, okay. I guess uh, it's good enough. View zoom zoom zoom. No, zoom. I don't see a zoom. I'm not sure how to do it. Um, sorry. Um, but basically, there's a new file here. It's called cluster <laughs> underscore group .tsv. This file has now appeared since I saved. Um, and what's in it, and I'm sure this is tiny as well, but it's a, a, a tab separated value table, which has two columns, cluster ID and group. And it's the cluster ID and the group. So I have one of them, 307, that's the one we went through and sorted, got labeled good. Um, a bunch of them we labeled MUA, as you remember. And this one just now, 37, um, I labeled noise. And so that's how this information is encoded. Uh, the other file that got updated is spike.clusters.mpy. And that file um, has the cluster labels of every spike. And so when we did a merge, for instance, um, all of those spikes from the original two clusters um, got the same levels, and this file got updated. Um, and that all was saved when we uh, when we saved. Um, OK. Um, there on the, on the link, um, which let me go ahead and drop the link in the chat before I forget about it. Um, one sec. On the link uh, that has the user guide, which Marius um, showed in one of his slides, and I'm going to drop in the chat now. Um, there is a description of, um, of, of exactly what those two files are and what, how you should think about them, um, et cetera, how you should understand how to use them, et cetera. Um, but basically, that's, that's, uh, that's, that's the output of the spike sorting. OK, we're coming back to noise now. Um, so I'm not sure this data set, I, I don't think I have an example of, um, of um, an, an artifact noise like a like a like a big electrical artifact um what you would look for is is a shape that doesn't look neuronal to you um and, and maybe a corellogram that doesn't look like it has the right um, temporal properties um how will you know that it's not neuronal uh, when neurons in fact have many different kinds of shapes i think the main characteristic that is likely to be different for most artifacts than neurons is that um, neurons have spatial localization. So a neuron should have this property that we saw for all these neurons, which is that it's got peak amplitude on one channel and then falling off spatially from there, like getting smaller and smaller spatially from there. If it's the same amplitude on all channels, uh, that's very suspicious. That's more like an artifact than a neuron. Uh, if it's uh, only existing on exactly one channel, that's also um, relatively suspicious. If there's literally zero amplitude on all of your surrounding channels, um, then that that is uh, relatively less. Like even the one that Maria showed you, that he said, you know, look, some neurons are very small and they might fall into between the gaps. Um, even that one, you could see a tiny amplitude on the on just the surrounding channels, and then zero amplitude on the ones further away. So um, I think if you see uh, something that has a weird shape and it's only on one channel or it's on all channels. Those are the characteristics I would be looking for for an artifact. I guess the question is um, more about, or well, another question <laughs> is how to distinguish like really small spikes from, or when would you call small spikes noise? So sometimes you get these really small blips and they could be neuronal, but do you always want to call them MUA or are there conditions when you would not? Yeah, I'll, I'll call it for, well, it, it depends on what you want to analyze. I mean, yeah, the data are there for you to see and you can decide whether you want to analyze it or not. What I usually do is if it looks like it came from a neuron, which is even if it's small amplitude, it, it you know has that property that like there's a central channel that's a little bit larger amplitude and then it falls off from there. Um, then even if it's low signals noise, um, I would I would still include it in MUA analyses. I wouldn't include it as a unit in a paper like when I when we had uh, our paper and we reported whatever number of neurons we reported uh, that did not include uh, little little noisy guys like that uh, but in an analysis that includes MUA then yeah it, those things probably came from spikes that were somewhere uh, near the probe but a little bit further away um, and and it makes sense to me to include them there 
uh, but you can make a different decision just based on what you want to be analyzing. Yeah, maybe I can add there that sometimes mm -hmm. I get these very small spikes and where I draw the line is whether they, there is a cutoff or how much the cutoff is in the amplitude view and if it changes. So if the amplitude changes and, you know, sometimes more neuron, uh, more spikes seem to be cut off, then really your firing rate is artificially affected. Then I usually throw it away because I don't want these uh, artifacts in my data. Um, then there's another question about merging. Do you rely on the feature view clusters to merge clusters or do you rely more on your eye and look straight into the waveform view? I noticed you did not browse too much through feature view PCs. Yeah, that's, that's correct. I don't browse too much through feature view. Um, I mean, I think feature view, the problem is that um, if you, if you see, um, if you, if you see that a single unit has two clusters in feature view, then that's great. It must have two clusters. But if you see them overlapping, it really doesn't tell you anything because there might just be a different channel or a different feature on which they're not overlapping. Um, and so uh, for merging, it's it's not that helpful, right? To the feature view, I would say. Mm -hmm. um, one question is, are the numbers of waveforms fixed? Not quite uh, oh, in, in, in the you mean graphically, like how many waveforms it's showing you? Um, I guess. And the question was, are they fixed? Is that what you said? Is the number of waveforms fixed? Yeah, no, they're not fixed. Um, so let me just share the thing again um, so I can try to make sure I understand what you're asking. Uh, so like right here, um, you're seeing, I think, maybe 32 or 20 or 32 different waveforms. Um, so I guess maybe there's two things you mean. One is how many um, sample waveforms is it showing you? And the other is how many channels do you get to see at once? And actually when you bring up Phi, I can tell you um, that you're gonna see fewer than this many channels um, because I uh, made a modification um, uh, that, that allowed me to see more channels. And you can also make a modification that allows you to see more example waveforms. Um, right now I think it's selling either 50 or 100. And so um, it'll only show like 50 different waveforms overlaid here. Um, uh, and then you can you can uh, make it show you more. Uh, that's uh, reasonably clearly documented in the Phi documentation. Um, you want to look under plugins and how to do plugins. Um, and there's an example plugin that does exactly this thing. Um, if you enable it, um, you can set how many different channels you see here, um, and also how many spikes it shows you. That that's one plugin that does both of those things. Um, and you just get a little text file. You edit both of those. And um, you put the plugin in the right place, and it'll it'll um, change your setting. Uh, so yeah, that's how to do that. Okay. Then, when you throw a similar but noisier cell into MUA, you also lose a lot of spikes that do belong to the original unit. I think you you showed this a few times. Is it worth to try to clean out the noise in the feature view by splitting it out? Wouldn't throwing real spikes out bias your firing rate estimates later? Yeah, exactly. So it's. It, I agree with that. It's a similar kind of um, uh, potential, um, you know, confound that depending on your analysis, if you're going to miss this, the, um, the, if your analysis is going to be biased by missing spikes, then you don't want to do that. Um, so uh, I guess par partly my decisions there were a bit based on the fact that um, what I'm used to looking at is, uh, is, uh, much longer files, in which case, if you see a small cluster like that with like 30 spikes, um, you're comparing it to a cluster that has 10,000 spikes and like the number of spikes, it just, yeah, you're throwing out a few, but it, they're, it's just, it's just such a small number that you, you know, it's not really worth your time to sort of waste your time with it. Um, if you had more similar uh, numbers, like you had, um, you know, 6,000 spikes and, and 3,000 spikes, and the 3,000 spikes was kind of, were kind of noisier. Um, yeah, maybe it's worth your time to try to clean it up. Um, I don't know. Yeah, and you would you could use feature view to try to split off things that are more noisy. You have to be careful here, though. So let me make another point about this. That um, that uh, remember that one thing that Killasort is doing is um, doing this template subtraction, so it can look for overlapping spikes and subtract off the um, the the confounding spikes to leave you with a denoised version of the spike you're looking for. Um, you don't see that in feature view. 
So a particularly noisy looking point in feature view could be noise. Um, it could be that noise may put it over there and you do want to delete it, but it could also be that there was just an overlapping spike and Killasort will have dealt with that properly, but feature view is going to show you some point way off to the side. So this is another reason to not put too much stock in feature view. I mean, it, it's there. I think it's useful for what it is, but um, you know, you, you don't want to go around like cutting all the noisy points off of the outside of the clusters on feature view. This is not the right way to use it. Um, let me try to, let me see if I can make that point more clearly with an example. Um, so like, let's just go back to one of these guys that we had. Um, so yeah. So like, look, we have a cluster, um, it corresponds to these guys. You can see with your eyes, right? That there's like lots of other spikes going on all the time. Um, this is a very busy part of the recording, right? It's like in here, there's all sorts of spikes going on all the time, overlapping each other. Um, and you can see some of those other spikes here. That, that's a spike, that's a spike. And it just, these spikes are just happened to occur at the same time as this unit. And Killister has done a good job, right? It rendered us um, a, a unit where we have a nice clean refractory period and we have um, you know, consistent looking waveforms and everything looks pretty good. Um, so what then do we interpret as these outlier blue spikes here? Well, let's just see what they look like. So if I clip off these guys, So our original unit is now in red um, because I guess it clipped the opposite direction when I was thinking. Um, and this, uh, these other spikes are in blue. Um, and I don't know, I mean, what is what is characteristic of these other spikes? Like they have basically, um, maybe, it's, maybe it's specifically that like, let's see, well, this was on channels 29 and 27. So let's see if we can find channels 29 and 27. There's 27. Where's 29? Oh, 29 is here. Um, so, you know, it's probably that um, it's, why did they appear out there? I guess it's specifically it's 29. I see. So they, basically this, these are the spikes that were a bit larger amplitude on 29. Um, you can see that they were larger amplitude. Um, and so I think Killasort decided that they're part of this unit because, um, because it, it will have thought that there was like an overlapping spike at roughly the same time, which ended up making this amplitude look a little bigger when in reality, it's the same spatial pattern of waveforms across all the channels. You know, whether it's right or not, it's honestly, it's hard to tell by eye, right? Like, what do you make of all of these um, sort of noisy looking spikes? Um, but the fact that it, it you know, produces these uh, good cross, good autocorrelograms um, and it produces flat cross correlograms um, I think really should give you confidence that the algorithm has like made good decisions about um, about what goes into it. We need to do some more merging on this guy. Cool. Um, yeah, that's what I would say about that. Um, easy question: Is there a log file in file that we can trace back? Yeah, I'll back? show you that. Uh, let's see. I'll do this. Uh, uh, So it's just this fight out log um, and it just has exactly all that stuff. So like for, it even has what clusters you selected. Um, not that you want to look at all that, but it's all there. Um, and, and at some point it will show us where we did merges and splits. Um, I guess mm -hmm. I did lots of, lots of options. Okay. But it's, it's all in there. It'll, it'll okay. show when you do merges and splits and stuff. And should we exclude all activity on a given context because of known problems with this context, I guess, channel? Um, well, so in fact, uh, you say, for example, impedance out of range. One of the good things about uh, neuropixels is that the, the uh, contacts are very, very consistent. Um, you can sort of see that here that like, you know, there's a difference in the biological noise level from here to here, but these contacts all have the same impedance, except I guess maybe this one. Um, but I don't think you're really going to find too much problem of that sort with neuropixels. But yeah, you could, oh, actually, this is something I should have shown. Um, let me let me go back actually and show that. So actually, I, I take it back. Um, so give me a sec. Are you you're still seeing my desktop, right? Oh. Yeah. Okay, good. So that, that's fine. One sec then. Uh, Okay, so back here to kill sort actually. 
Um, I will show you uh, something I forgot to mention. So you can actually, if you identify bad channels, um, you can drop the channels here. So you can do that. So let me, uh, so you, you do that by right clicking and it will literally, like I can drop these channels out. You see they're just, dis the channels are disappearing and it's indicated that over here by making them yellow. Um, and so, and I can drop them by right clicking them over here um, and add them back in by right clicking them the yellow ones and now they're added back in and I get that spike back. Um, it might be clear if I do, um, if I come over here. So like if I, for some reason, I thought that was noise and I wanted to exclude it. If I right click, It's getting mm. yellow. Yeah, it's getting yellow, but the spikes aren't disappearing, which I thought they mm. would because it's, uh, hmm. uh, let's see. Uh, so it's correctly making them gray on the raw. There may be a slight bug, um, but basically if you, there may be a bug in the traces version of this view, um, but I think that the uh, the version here is correct, and you could see that they were they were disappearing over here. Um, and so, if you have a particularly noisy channel, you can right click it and get rid of it, um, or add it back in um, that way. Um, so yeah, that's how you can exclude a noisy channel. Mm -hmm. okay. um, how can we extract waveforms of each cluster after manual clustering, or I guess merging? since the file template.npy doesn't update. Yeah, you should extract the waveforms from the uh, from the file itself um, rather than using the template waveforms. Um, there's a function um, on the uh, Spikes repository um, to do that. I, I should, let's see, hold on, let me... Um, okay. So I'm gonna I'm gonna leave these other questions because I want to just address a few more things and I see that we're running out of time. Um, so let me just quickly uh, jump back to PowerPoint. Um, I guess at this point I should stop the desktop share and share the PowerPoint. So let me just show a couple uh, more critical cases um, that you might encounter. So um, if you encounter this sort of thing where it looks like um, over time one unit becomes another unit. Um, and you can see that, for instance, in the, um, in the uh, feature view, then that's a case in which you should merge because some drifting must have happened. Again, hopefully with Killsort 2 and 2.5, you get very rarely this case, but this is the kind of thing that can happen if there's errors due to drifting. This is bursting. So there's a question about bursting before. Um, if you have bursting, you often see this, that um, one spike has larger amplitude than, than another, but it's on roughly the same channels they'll have a, a clean um, cross correlogram, but a very, very um, asymmetric cross correlogram. And this means that the red one is always following the blue one, um, which is what happens in a burst. So this classic report that the waveforms indeed change during a burst. The first waveform is uh, larger, the second and third and fourth waveforms get smaller and smaller in amplitude. That's the main effect. They also get wider actually, um, but the main effect is the amplitude gets smaller. And so that's exactly what we're seeing here is that um, on the later spikes of a burst, they're on the same channels, but they're smaller in amplitude, um, and therefore you get this um, asymmetric cross correlogram that tells you red always follows blue, not the other way around, um, and you get a clean refractory period because, in fact, they come from the same neurons. Um, okay, uh, splitting we already talked about. Um, yeah, so characteristics of good neurons, and let me talk, say like two words about um, quality metrics. So clean refractory period obviously is characteristic of a good, characteristic of a good neuron. Um, large amplitude um, should have a dissimilar waveform to anything else nearby. And there are these classic quality metrics that, for instance, um, uh, quantify like isolation distance and other things um, to, to sort of put a number to this. You can use this. There was a question earlier about uh, whether you can use this with, um, with uh, neuropixels because you have such high dimensional data. You can. We have a version of it on GitHub um, that that's, accounts for this in some way. Um, you want a consistent waveform, you want spikes not to be lost below a threshold. This is that non-Gaussian amplitude thing that I was talking about before. Okay, so um, these are the things you look for, um, certainly by eye. 
um, obviously you also want to quantify these things. And what I'll point you to here is there's um, the recent Allen Institute paper um, and their ECE FIS, uh, extracellular EFIS, uh, ECE FIS um, repository um, has a sort of Python, modern Python implementation of uh, the, the quality metrics that you might use for all of these things. And in their paper, they give what their um, unit, what their uh, quality metric cutoffs were for including um, data. Um, the International Brain Lab is working on some, um, what we think are some improvements on some of these metrics. Um, so there's still development on, on quality metrics. I think it's an important field. Um, and uh, we at the International Brain Lab will be um, publishing something on this, you know, within a year, something like that, and we'll have a new version of code to use. Um, so I think there is like progress on this and, and improvement and uh, we're getting to points where the quality metrics are better. Um, but but um, uh, basically you have to um, apply ones that you can, but also sort of be careful to evaluate that they're not throwing out things you wanted to keep or keeping things that you wanted to throw out. Um, let me, I'll share these slides so you can read about this suggested process. Um, it's kind of what I already um, uh, went over. Actually, this, these slides are all, um, this is all, yeah, okay. Um, okay, okay, the last point I want to make, and this is the final point and an important point. Okay, um, principle, no neuron is universally agreeably, quote unquote, good. Okay, um, so my story about this is the following. Um, we made these recordings with NeuroPixels Pros when we first got them in like 2016. And um, we were writing this paper that we wanted to submit to Nature. And I was going to say how awesome NeuroPixels Pros were for data. And I was like, you know, people aren't really going to understand. Um, I was making the argument, people aren't really going to understand just how high quality this data is if we don't just like really show them the raw data and how good it is um, and like how good these, these unit isolations are. And I, I um, put together this sort of plot that was like this, where it sort of showed, um, sort of like a view of phi, you know, it really shows all this stuff. It shows you the waveforms, the signals and noise. Um, it shows you the, the um, PC features, the auto parallelograms, et cetera. And um, shows, you know, just how beautiful all of the neurons are. And I was like, if we claim that there are 700 neurons and we just show them this figure for all 700 neurons, like people will really believe it. And so um, I was at a happy hour and John O'Keefe was there. And I was like, John, I got this idea. We should show figures for all of these neurons. Um, and it'll really prove that we're really talking about single neurons um, when we when we say this and not just junk. And um, John looked at this and he he squinted and he looked at it carefully. And this was the best neuron I had, right? 500 microvolts amplitude, signal to noise ratio of 80, right? I, isolation distance 200. This is a great neuron. Um, John looks at it and he squints and he says, you know, I'm just not sure if this is a really good neuron. I'd want to see more figures. And I was like, okay. So at this point. Um, no neuron is universally agreeably good. There's no such thing as good and bad, okay? Um, you will never like have every person agreeing that this neuron is a good neuron. Um, so what do you do instead? So like, I think you should disabuse yourself of the notion that you're going to do the spike sorting process, have a set of neurons that are your good neurons, um, and then do you know, all of your analysis being able to forget entirely about the fact that you ever went through this horrible process of spike sorting. So what do you do instead? Um, recognize that there's a continuum between your best and your junk. Um, there's some plots on this, like, you know, let me skip it. Um, the result is don't forget your raw data. And specifically, um, there's a suggestion that Kenneth has made in, in a paper of his um, of how to deal with this kind of thing, which is literally plotting your quality metrics against your um, neural effect size. So literally this is a plot of x-axis isolation distance. It's a quality metric of the spike sorting and y-axis um, actual scientific effect, which in this case was about the spatial information in bits per spike of the neurons. And the point here is that um, if, if it is the case that as your quality metric goes up and up, your effect size gets smaller and smaller, then you worry that in fact, you're only getting that effect by artifact, that it was an artifact of the fact that you had crappy neurons, and that if you had better and better neurons, your effect goes away. And in this case, that's not the case. Instead, um, the effect size is flat as a function of isolation distance above a certain um, quality. And so that um, gives you confidence that your spike sorting did not lead you to falsely conclude something about the spatial information in this case. Um, okay, so I think, 
you know, it's hard to do that. You'd like to instead just throw away all your data, um, uh, all the raw data, and forget the fact that um, you ever spent all those hours on spike sorting. Um, but uh, I really don't think that that's the right approach. I think you need to keep in mind, like, what kinds of spike sorting errors will influence this algorithm. Um, can I quantify how much they're influencing the algorithm? Can I can I try to understand whether they they specifically gave me the result that I got, um, and go back to your to your spike sorting uh, as you do your analyses? Okay, um, we're over time. Um, I will um, stand for a few more minutes and try to answer a few more questions. Uh, but certainly, if anybody needs to go, um, by all means do, and we'll make all these slides and. Um,